Have you ever thought about the negative impact of misinformation that has been spread across the cannabis industry? Our guest on this episode is Dan Grace, founder and CEO at Dark Heart Nursery. Since 2007, Dark Heart Nursery has specialized in cultivating high quality clones for growers across California, and they also offer lab services. Jesse Patan and Dan talk about receiving misinformation when it comes to cultivation and how a big part of his organization's mission is supporting farmers through science. Dan also talks about Dark Heart's new ideas and approaches to growing cannabis and solving cultivation challenges as they occur. For trichomes.com, I'm producer David Fortin, and this is The High Ground. On this show, we feature the leaders of the cannabis industry. We talk to everyone from farmers to CEOs and public officials, anyone making an impact on the cannabis community and beyond. Dan, let me just first say thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Yeah, glad to be here with you, Jesse. I really appreciate it. Uh, and the first question I wanted to ask you is um, one that I'm probably going to mispronounce, but can you tell me what exactly is hop latent viroid? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hop latent viroid is really I got it right. Yeah, you got it 100%. <laughs> right, so good job. Um, it's a, a, an interesting and devastating disease of cannabis. Um, this is a, a pathogen um, that we identified several years ago. Uh, but it's a disease that's been uh, hurting cannabis farmers for many, many years now, uh, probably going back to, boy, 2012 at least. Uh, it's known by many names across cannabis um, and uh, many different symptoms. Uh, people will call it dudding. Dud you know, in my neck of the woods, the Bay Area, in Northern California and stuff, people uh, called it dudding very frequently. Other people will hmm. call it um, yellowhead and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I think even what people call genetic drift is attributable to hop latent viroid, but whatever you call it, um, it is an infectious disease that lives in cannabis and it causes some really bad effects, um, significant diminishment in yield, um, you know, very low output of THC, very low, um, terpene output. So your smells go away. Uh, and basically what you know, sometimes people would call it duds or, you know, dudding, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, what, and that's because what they, the experience is that they would, uh, that they would have a crop of plants. Often there'd be many plants that were just fine. And there'd be some that were, uh, you know, short, stunted, didn't develop very many flowers. The flowers they did put out, you know, they smell like hay and, and there's no potency. Hmm. So a couple of follow-ups on that. I assume that it is uh, contagious to some capacity. Do you know how it sort of spreads between plants? Yeah. So this is a, you know, this was a mystery for years and years and hmm. um, through some uh, ingenuity and some early investment um, in some science work on our side, we were finally able to definitively determine that hop latent viroid was actually causing this dudding um, uh, symptomology. Um, the viroid itself is, um, you know, it's called hop latent viroid because it was first identified in hops, which of course is one of the closest relatives to cannabis. And so most of what we know about it um, actually comes from hops. Um, you know, a viroid, for those that are really um, sciencey, a viroid is similar to a virus, but um, much, much smaller, actually. Uh, it's a much less complex organism. Uh, it doesn't have what's called like a protein coat around it. So it's like a floating piece of what they call RNA, a very small piece of tissue, you know, of, of genetic material that floats around and causes nefarious things to happen in the plant. The, you know, in cannabis, as with hops, the primary way that hop latent viroid is spread is through mechanical transmission, which means... Um, you know, especially with tools, you know, so pruners and scissors and stuff like that. If you're going through and you're, you know, pruning a plant and then you move to another plant, the sap and the juices and things like that that are on your scissors will transmit over to the to the other plant. It's, you know, I mm. hesitate to use a colorful analogy, but it's sort of like a sexually transmitted disease. It spreads you huh. know, by touch from one one plant to another. Interesting. Um, but, you know, we're learning more and more about the ways that this is transmitted every day. Um, you know, for example, our team has just demonstrated that um, not only can this 
transmit from live plant to live plant, but actually, um, you know, staff members or, or other people who are handling dried cured cannabis, like say you're rolling a pre-roll or smoking a joint or something like that, um, that contact alone from the dried finished cannabis can lead to transmission of hoplite and viroid to the, to the living plants as well. Wow. So what is the impact of the hoplite and viroid on the product? Is it in any way dangerous to consume uh, one of these dud plants? Good question. So uh, from a human health perspective, there's no, there's no, um, there's no risk. Mm. Um, this is not a, uh, you know, certainly not a disease that humans can catch. Um, you know, the, there, uh, there's only one viroid disease known to interesting fact known to affect humans. Uh, huh. and this is certainly not one of them. So, you know, we have, uh, it's not intended to target us and our, our immune systems, even if it did target us would be, um, you know, very capable of offending it off. So no human health problems from the viroid. But it is, a, you know, devastatingly impactful um, to commercial cultivation. Yeah, and I, I've heard you say that many farmers aren't even a, aware of this. Like this, this was a recent discovery. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. It's a tricky one. Uh, very tricky. One of the reasons is, um, you know, that that latent word, right? So mm -hmm. what science, you know, when they called it latent, what they meant was this is a disease that can persist in the crop asymptomatically. Um, so frequently we'll go into a grow and, um, you know, we now, by the way, my company offers a comprehensive suite of diagnostics and um, consulting and curative services around uh, the hop latent viroid. So, you know, we'll frequently go into a grow and um, we'll, uh, you know, they'll, the things, you know, very healthy grow, things look good. And we'll do some screening for the viroid and we'll find that even among the apparently very healthy plants, um, there can be sometimes quite significant um, infections of the viroid. Um, because of that, it makes it very, very hard to um, control without some more sophisticated diagnostic tools. So we've, you know, we've had the experience, as have many, that the crop seems very healthy and looks good. You don't think there's any infection, don't have any reason to think there would be. Um, and then over time, you'll start to see it pop up and it'll get worse and worse. And by the time you know you have an infection, pretty much your whole garden is infected and you're seeing very significant crop losses. Wow. So I promise we'll move on to other subjects at some point, but I guess the the last question that I kind of wanted to ask with this is, and, and it might be kind of a silly one or, or a foolish one, but um, where does an infection or an outbreak begin? Does it require a sick plant uh, that somehow ends up or, or you know, where where's the source of these sorts of things? Well, um, you know, who's to say where it came from initially, mm. but this is a disease that at this point is very widespread throughout the cannabis industry. Um, the vast majority of sites that we've tested have had some level of hoplite and viroid infection. And um, sometimes wow. the pressures at those sites can be very high. You know, at times we've tested facilities that could be 50, 60, 70 percent infected, meaning 50 to 70 wow. percent of the samples that we're collecting test positive for hoplite and viroid. So, you know, it's it's interesting. We we all sort of this this last year have uh, amateur degrees in epidemiology. <laughs> so we ah. can draw on some of our COVID experience. There's you know, it's a close corollary for hoplite and viroid. You know, as we see now in America, there's a high enough virus load, load with COVID that, you know, um, it's very easy to transmit. And I would say the same applies to hoplite and viroid in the cannabis industry. There's such a high baseline level of the viroid out there, and it's quite easy to transmit. And as a result, um, you know, we, we see widespread um, outbreaks and reinfections and all the things that, that come with that scenario. So I'm going to, uh, it's probably kind of weird to have your own words read back to you, but I'm going to, I'm going to quote you here. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, you, uh, in an interview, you said, uh, as far as what concern, as far as what concerns me, misinformation is a big one. Uh, the pre-legalization cannabis market had virtually zero peer reviewed scientific research, which resulted in false and pseudoscience information being spread and shared through social media and more. One such example is the belief in genetic drift, which you mentioned earlier. Um, 
So can you kind of uh, take this opportunity to maybe clear up for us uh, what exactly is this belief uh, of genetic drift and, and maybe where is it wrong? Yeah, no, and that's that's just an example. I I, I stand by those words. I'm uh, I was a little nervous sure. there, but I, I stand by it. I think, and look, that's not a um, that's not a judgment on the industry before legalization. Oh no, no, that, that's um, that's about you know it applies to us as well. We never had the resources or you know the equipment or the um, team to to get this kind of research done, and it's great that we do now. Um, hmm. Genetic drift is um, you know the idea is that well. What, w- what farmers observed in the space was that over time, you know, cannabis is primarily propagated through cuttings. You grow a, you grow a mother, you take a cutting and you have a child. Eventually that child turns into a mother and creates more children, et cetera. Over time, you know, you could get many generations in, you know, maybe that blue dream you've been growing for 10 years, it might be on 10th or 12th generation or something like that. Um, the thought with genetic dr- or the observation of genetic drift was that farmers would say, you know, over time, these clones are not performing as well as they used to. You know, it's just full stop that this blue dream isn't as good as the blue dream from generation one, right? Or whatever it might be. Um, And so the thought there was that perhaps what was happening is there were mutations and other defects that, you know, physically changed the genetics of plants over these many, many generations. And, you know, there's there's some reason to believe that that could be possible. Um, every life form does have genetic mutations that happen over time. And if those happened at a certain frequency, it could, it could cause some problems with the plants down the line. Um, however, um, you know, from a strictly scientific perspective, th- those types of mutations are, are actually fairly uncommon. Um, and it would be unlikely to see the level of change that that people were observing over the amount of time that they were observing them. Um, So, you know, from our perspective, you know, even when we were hearing, especially back in 2012, 13, 14 or so, that that people were observing a lot of this genetic drift problem, we always suspected that there was something else at play. And in particular, Hmm. what we suspected and still suspect is that most of what people call genetic drift um, is actually the accumulation of pathogens in the mother stock. Um, so the other problem you get with that generational mothering process is that, you know, any diseases that that mother picks up are passed from generation to generation, right? If, if, every, if every generation the plant picks up one new pathogen, well, 10 generations, you've got a pretty sickly plant, right? Hmm. And, um, you know, so that's what, that's, you know, the viroid, I believe, is a big part of that, you know, and again, it explains why you don't see anything clearly wrong with the plant, especially in the first few generations, but over time, as the viroid load increases, um, it can have an underlying depression of, of yield, and then ultimately, it, you know, you can start to see it very acutely when it starts to become symptomatic. Um, but there's other pathogens as well, some that we're aware of and, and others I'm sure that we're yet to discover that build up in the mothers over time and have this depressing effect on on quality and yield. Things like, you know, um, vascular diseases like, uh, you know, pythium and things like that that build up in the plant. Wow. So I, I'll admit that when we started talking today, I didn't necessarily expect that this would feel so much like a doctor visit, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, it, it's really interesting. And you, you did say before we started recording that uh, a big part of your organization's mission is supporting farmers and um, and doing that through the the science that you guys are, are working on. So I want to ask you more about the the team that you have there and, and what you're doing, but um, just in terms of, of, you know, going forward, just even with what you were just talking about, um, in, I assume that, that some of this has to do with the way that we're breeding, uh, plants. Are you guys working on, on new ideas about how to approach uh, growing cannabis? Yeah. Yeah, There's there's, there's a a lot that we're doing. Um, you know, some of it is we have the industry we have today. Right. Um, and so some of what we have to do is work with what we have today. Right. And Mm -hmm. we, we've spent a lot of time doing that and that, you know, it includes things like the, our diagnostics program, where both internally and as a service, we provide um, services to identify the viroid and many other diseases. 
We have curative programs where we work to take these clonal genetics and cure them of diseases like the viroid so that you can kind of start fresh, right? Kind of back to that first generation. Um, hmm. And, you know, and a variety of other, um, of course, we have our internal production protocols to make sure that when we um, sell plants to a, to a farmer that they're, that they're getting the cleanest, the best plants possible. Those are all things that we do to mitigate the way that we produce plants today. But some of what I'm most excited about is, you know, really, um, really changing the whole model for how we produce these plants and, and, uh, and as a result, kind of heading some of these things off at the pass. You know, we do a lot of work in cannabis solving cultivation challenges um, as they occur, right? Solving the, you know, we've got the viroid. How do we clean it up? How do we solve it? We've got powdery mildew. How do we clean it up? How do we solve it? Most of these problems, I believe, are best solved far upstream of when they manifest themselves. And I think many ultimately have solutions in the genetics themselves. Um, and so that's a big focus area for us. It's um, it's improving the genetics so that the plants themselves are resistant to these uh, to these pressures, or they perform better in the environments that we're growing them in. Uh, it's also changing the production system. You know, I talked about the viroid, how it spreads through mechanical transmission, and the cloning process that leads to that over time. You know, I believe, and this is as someone who uh, who has uh, produced plants. But you know, as clones for, gosh, fourteen years now, and and we've and we still do it, and it's and uh, it's our core business. But I believe ultimately, um, we will move away from clonal production, and we'll start to you know leverage seedling production much more, which, which will help solve some of these problems again at their source. And that really does represent sort of a, a fundamental departure from where you began your business. Um, you guys were sort of a clone nursery in the beginning, is that right? That's right. Yeah. We, uh, you know, Dark Heart Nursery, um, you know, we started in the space as farmers ourselves and uh, quickly learned, um, you know, totally different eras, 2007 or so, and uh, indoor kind of basement grow set up for us and quickly learned <laughs> how naive we were about the space and, and especially <laughs> how naive we were about how hard it was to be a farmer, a cannabis farmer in particular, mm -hmm. right? you have all of the people think cannabis farmer that that must be easy but actually it's more like a double whammy you have all of the problems of cannabis and all of the problems of farming <laughs> ah. um so once we figured that out we started to orient ourselves to you know how could we solve these problems for other farmers other people weren't doing it at the time and our entry into the market was right where your growth starts at the at the genetics at the clones um so we focused on how can we produce how can we find and introduce high quality genetics and how can we make sure that the plants that we're giving you are really high quality, that they're vigorous, that they're big, they're strong, um, that they're pest free so that you've got the best shot to have a, to have a healthy, successful, profitable grow. And that's been the, you know, that's been the, certainly the core product line for us ever since. Um, but we do now have this opportunity to really reinvent some of that and to go into deeper areas to solve some of the deeper challenges that we've, uh, that we've never been able to really address before. Hmm. Uh, so I do, I, I heard that starting out, you guys had some, um, kind of like a stop and go start in the beginning. I don't know if that's fair to call it that, but, uh, some, some breaking and entering, uh, can oh, you tell yeah. me a little well, bit was, about the early days? It was always, I mean, again, this was, um you know, 2000 and, uh, 2007 Oakland. Right. So, um, <laughs> it was very much still a gray market. Um, we were fortunate to be in Oakland because it was a whiter shade of gray here than almost anywhere else at the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, we had, uh, you know, we, we, it was always go, go, go. It wasn't fits and starts in that way, but we had some major challenges that, you know, that people who are getting into the space now probably aren't familiar with. Yeah. Including, um, some significant, uh, uh, you know, um, burglaries that almost put us out of business. In fact, I like to tell the story a little bit. We had an early facility, well, our first warehouse facility in a bad neighborhood in Oakland. Um, back in those days, you know, you might get broken into. And and if you were, you didn't have a lot of resources with the local police. And as a result of that, oh, yeah. you were sort of marked at that point. You'd be broken into over and over again. Oh. And uh, so, you know, we, we went through it a couple of times and we were tiny little, you know, we were 20 something tiny little business 
couldn't really withstand it. And we were about to get out of the space, frankly. It was a it was a physical risk to us. It was certainly not making mm. business sense at the time. And um, I'll never forget it. We had a customer at the time. You know, we told him, look, we're, we're pulling up stake. We can't do it anymore. Can't make it work. And we had a customer at the time who came to us and said, please don't, please don't, uh, please don't stop. You know, I need, you know, and, and it's so important to remember because we were, it was such a critical service at the time um, and still is, you know, but they came to us, they said, please don't stop. I need your plants. You know, I'm working on scaling my business right now too. I can't do it without having great genetics like you provide. I'm, you know, as part of scaling my business, I'm moving out of an old place. Will you come take over this old place? You know, just give me, just give us the clones we need while you get on your feet. And, uh, you know, and then you can build your business from there. And hmm. so, we, you know, we took a look at it and it was a funky little mezzanine unit, <laughs> it, you know, but most importantly, in a much nicer part of town. And uh, we did this deal with them. We, you know, we, we got over there, we got back on our feet and uh, we really were able to start building and growing the business from, from that facility. I like to tell that story for two reasons. Um, one, it, it reminds me of, you know, in those early days, how much of a movement we were and, and how much of a um, kind of a sharing atmosphere there was among um, all of us that were part of that movement, you know, we, we would help each other out and we would uh, try to find ways to, to just keep this thing going, you know, outside of our own personal gains, you know, and how do we keep this going so that um, whether it's us or someone else that's at the front of the pack, that most importantly, this movement can keep moving. Um, but also just, you know, I like to center myself around how important we were in that customer's world. You know, of course, we always strive to be that, that key partner, that linchpin for the customer. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to see, it was certainly nice to see back then. And it was existential for us to have that kind of opportunity. Um, it's nice to see that, um, we're really executing on it. When, when we have an event like that, we know we're really executing on our mission when we become that important for our customers. Yeah, that, um, I, I mean, needless to say, most people seem to have a very difficult road into um, the industry and, and you know, I, I wouldn't blame you for like stopping after the second time, you know, you had had all of your stuff stolen. But um, for you, it seems that there was um, a real interest in, in not just the, the sort of scientific uh, botany side of, of, cannabis but um was would you say that there was sort of like an activism social justice focus as well oh very much yeah it was, that's, that was the world more mm. than anything else that was the world that i came from um before getting into cannabis um you know it was my partner sarah and i our co-founder um you know we were in our mid-20s when we started the company um and you know we we did have a passion for horticulture but more than that this was a space for us where you know, one of the only spaces available where we saw an opportunity to advance a social change that we believe very passionately in, um, to be able to do that while engaging in one of our hobbies, you know, one of, something we're really interested in, which is horticulture. Um, and to, you know, by the way, number three, make a living hmm. while doing it. So that for us was a kind of a perfect trifecta. Um, yeah, people don't get that opportunity. But I mean, certainly like, uh, it was a lot of hardship and trial and, and a, a lot of work. Um, but not everyone gets an opportunity to, to kind of have a, a great fit like that. And I'm, I'm really proud that we were able to, I mean, we were, I should, you know, be clear too. We had some privileges being young, um, you know, being, um, white, you know, um, coming from middle-class backgrounds that allowed us to kind of, lean in and take some of those mm. risks in, in other ways that other people didn't. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really proud that, that we were um, able and willing to do that. And, and frankly, you know, I'm proud of all the work that others that, that did it with us um, did. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people weren't as lucky as us, you know, over time, a lot of people were, you know, did uh, experience real consequences um, for, for getting in early in that way. But, you know, looking back upon it now, I think, uh, 
I th- it's amazing what we've accomplished, you know, not, and I don't mean us. I mean, it's amazing what we as a, as a community, as a movement have accomplished and, uh, and how far this has moved. I'd love to talk to you a little bit too, um, about, about some of the issues that I guess, you know, drove you, it sounds like to get into this in the first place and, and kind of catch up to kind of where we are now. Um, how would you say that, that, I mean, I, I, let me let me not ask you how are we doing overall, but um, what are some some things that you think could perhaps be done better when it comes to um, perhaps correcting for the wrongs of uh, cannabis prohibition, uh, some of the side effects and consequences, and where does the the industry's responsibility lie? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, um, and I've I have some. Uh, I've, I've been involved not only in those early days, but um, been very involved in um, ongoing policy work and um, uh, advocacy, you know, as we've become an industry. So it's something I've, uh, you know, at a local state and uh, mostly at a local and state level. So I've had some time to think about it. Um, you know, I think that, I guess my, you know, f- from an industry perspective, I think that um, it's very important that, New entrants in the space um, recognize that recognize that disparity and and the difference in opportunities. I think it's important that they recognize the work that everyone in the movement did to get this industry to where it is. And I, I do think I feel at you know at some level morally that um, that folks have a responsibility to give back. You know, whether that means continuing to invest in the, you know, we still have work to do, um, uh, you know, in public policy, we will for decades, right? Um, So the first step is making sure that, um, you know, I always, first time I visit a new grower, right? Don't forget to sign up for your trade groups. This, you know, this, we have to keep this going forward. We're not done yet, right? Um, But I think, you know, socioeconomically too, I do think that, um, I I think now this, I think probably will mean something different to each operator, given their circumstances. But I, I think that, um, I think we do have a responsibility to think about, um, those that came before us and especially how we can make sure to be leading on, um, you know, uh, racial and and wealth inequality in this country. Um, you know, again, that'll mean something different for, for each company, how they're executing that. But I, I think it's important that it's, that it's part of all of our, um, all of our DNA. Now, now that said, and I want to be clear about this. Um, I think that from a public policy perspective, some of the types of um, some of the types of programs that are being offered um, to, you know, to quote unquote correct these disparities are really ill-targeted and 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 very um, badly um, crafted and and you know even worse executed. You know, um, some of the equity programs in particular in the space, I think, are are very detrimental, not only to the industry, but to the communities that they're intended to support. Um, we could go into the technical dif- difficulties, but I, I would say at a high level, um, what I would like to see more of from a public policy perspective is asking, you know, what I see right now in some of the public policies is that, um, you know, our politicians are asking other industry groups, other groups, frankly, that in many cases were also negatively impacted by the war on drugs. They're asking for us to sort of um, make up for the wrongs of the war on drugs. Hmm. I think at some fundamental level, that's really the wrong orientation, right? You know, when we look at the groups that benefited from the war on drugs, um, we should really be looking to them as the source of, uh, as the source of reparations, if you will. Um, that's really, know, really. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you off, ahead. but I, th- I think ahead. that's fascinating. Um, can you can you talk a little bit more about that, like perhaps with a little bit of specificity about in what ways you feel the industry is being asked? Is, is that through taxes? Is that through? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what does that look like? T- you know, typically the programs that we see right now are, um, you know, uh, so, some form of tax or fee, you know some form of cost that's being passed on mm-hmm. to the industry and being used to fund. Um, you know, equity programs, you know, I use that term broadly, right? Some, right, right, right. Um, whether that's a tax advantage to disadvantaged uh, 
communities or preferential licensing or whatever the case may be. Right. I think those programs are right, you know, but I think that, um, I think that they're, they're mistargeted. Right. And I, I don't think yeah. what's worst, I think, is that some of the programs are really structured as win lose arrangements. Right. It's, well, for example, in my city in Oakland, when they first launched their program, it was really, you know, we're only going to have X amount of regular licenses and X amount of uh, equity licenses. Right. And that created a almost a competitive environment. Right. You know, it's, hmm. it's you're, you know, you're, you're going to support one community, but only by limiting another. Right. I think, first of all, there's many more win win solutions. Um, which are much better for the industry and, and frankly, are, would be more successful for um, impacted communities as well. But even more broadly than that, I think, you know, again, at, at sort of a moral level, it's not, you know, it's maybe some, but broadly speaking, it's not other members of the cannabis community who drove the war on drugs and the economic disparities that those uh, led to. It's, you know, law enforcement, it's politicians themselves, it's, um, uh, you know, it's the prison industrial complex, right? These are the sure. groups that we should really be looking for to make reparations for the ills of the war on drugs. Uh, and I'd love to see a, a lot more of that. You know, when we reallocate budgets for um, equity programs, I'd love to see that coming from, you know, from, you know, the prison budgets, from the law enforcement budgets, um, right? From the DEA, right? Yeah. These are the groups that, that, uh, that benefited over the years. Absolutely. I guess I have probably enough time for one more question. So I'm going to try and ask you two. Um, let's see. I, we have, you know, legalization is in the air. Um, it's probably going to take a lot longer than anybody actually wants, but the conversations are happening. And I think it's important to, you know, get our voices out there and start orienting um, towards where, you know, some of the battles may be. And obviously uh, there are multiple conversations to have here, but um, one that I think I'm, I'm kind of interested in is we hear a lot about expungement um, as a tool uh, of, of remedy for, um, the situation that we have where many, 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 many people find themselves with a, a criminal record or still in prison facing a sentence for purely a cannabis charge, even in California. Um, and I guess I'm wondering uh, when we hear talk about plans and, and I know, you know, until you sit down and read an entire bill, you can't know, but I sometimes worry that expungement gets a little bit too much attention and that there isn't as much focus on what we're going to do about people who are still currently serving time in prison. Um, do you have any sense about that? Like, are there conversations that are happening about how to handle that? Um, Cause it sometimes feels like it's a separate piece. Yeah, you know, um, I, I don't know enough about the current federal um, situation and especially some of the bills that are now working, you know, hopefully will be working their way through um, Congress uh, in this administration. Um, but I, I can say that it is something that I, I sincerely hope. Well, I mean, as we've seen it roll through the states, we've seen different versions, right? Some states have done right. better than others, whether that's, you know, yeah, you can do expungement, but it's a lengthy, hard process. Or I believe California took a pretty progressive approach and said, "Look, we're going to basically automatically expunge a lot of a lot of um, a lot of these convictions." I'm not, you know, I, I couldn't speak with um, authority on how um, you know how people that are still incarcerated um, are, are treated in these circumstances, but I can say that I hope that whatever they move forward with will. Um, you know, make sure to vacate those, those incarcerations. Um, you know, we should all make sure that to advocate for that. It's important that we don't, uh, that we don't leave these people behind. Absolutely. I mean, that that's the most impacted group. So we got to make sure they're first and foremost on our minds. So we've talked about uh, the future of the industry. So Dan, what's next for Dark Heart Nursery? Yeah. So at Dark Heart, we're especially excited about our breeding program. Um, you know, we want to, 
Uh, we've got a great team now on board. We get to leverage some of the work that our lab team does, um, and we've got a field team. So it's kind of best of the both worlds. The lab team gets to accelerate the breeding program, and the breeding team is out there doing the hard work that you have to do for any crop, trialing crops, doing crosses and stuff like that. Um, so we're really eager to move, you know, move the the problems that cultivators face to move those solutions into the genetics themselves and, and to, you know, and also to promote and uh, develop more seed based production. You know, so see more and more growers growing from seed. That's, that'll be a good, uh, good accomplishment. I'm looking forward to making it happen. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, Dan. I, I really do appreciate it. Shout out once again to Dan Grace of Dark Heart Nursery for taking the time to talk to us. You can find more cannabis industry reporting at trichomes.com, as well as more great shows like this one. If you're a member of the cannabis community and you have a story you want to share with us, reach out. You can reach the show at highground at trichomes.com. Please take a second to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. It really helps others find the show. You can also join the discussion with industry insiders and get your voice heard by joining the community at trichomes.com and following us on all social media. For trichomes.com, I'm producer David Fortson. Thank you for listening and be well.